Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. Politics is weird, right? Well, nobody predicted the presidential race would be decided between a werewolf and a vampire. The vampire won handily. That damn hypnotic gaze is cheating, I says. And now we live in a hellish dystopia of blood-sucking bureaucrats. Come to think of it, I guess we did before, but now it's literal. I, I mean, think about it. If Senator Howler had been elected, he would have been a regular president pretty much all of the time. We'd only have to worry about him being out at night during a full moon. That's it. And I guess the Secret Service would have to worry about assassins carrying silver bullets. But they already worry about regular bullets. So what's the big deal? But no, America had to be enthralled by then-candidate Emilia Lifedrain's smoky words and striking beauty. She said she was older than the country itself, and she personally knew George Washington, that she lived through the Civil War and the Great Depression, that she knew what pitfalls to avoid, to preserve the glory of the nation for generations to come. The real kicker was when she started filming those hokey commercials with her zombie husband and those dead-eyed kids, but they used CGI and lighting tricks to make them look kind of normal. At the end of every commercial, she would look directly into the camera and turn on that hypnotic gaze, telling the audience to search their hearts to know they really wanted to vote Amelia for president. What you've got to keep in mind is politics was pretty normal until relatively recently. Vampires and werewolves were considered mythical creatures, the stuff of fairy tales and ghost stories. But everything changed when Abraham Howler ran for Congress on an environmental protection platform. When he was re-elected several times before running for Senate, he came out of the lycanthropic closet, proudly declaring himself a vegetarian who was more concerned with preserving his habitat than making humans hors d'oeuvres. He quickly became the face of a new supernatural American movement, which divided along party lines when the vampires made themselves known. For untold centuries, vampires wanted to remain legend, but they couldn't keep hiding when a viral video showed body camera footage of a police officer being decapitated by a feral fiend who drank his blood as it gushed from his arteries. Soon, lobbying groups sprang up to promote vampires as stylish, cosmopolitan champions of human excellence. After all, they argued, the better life is for people, the better people taste. Somehow the effort worked, although I'll say again, their hypnotic powers make you act outside of your own best interests. When Amelia announced her candidacy, she did a PR blitz with older, established media types who acted like they had known her for years, presumably because they did. She claimed she was over 600 years old, but she didn't look a day over 25. That was a bit of a detriment as voters initially favored a more mature candidate. She won her party's nomination by holding a marathon series of midnight whistle-stop tours in which she glad-handed with the public and kissed babies without eating them. The gloves came off after the national conventions. With the candidates set, someone started photoshopping a collar and leash on pictures of Senator Howler, and people took turns showing which special interest groups were the master he was secretly serving. Other trolls would throw dog food at his campaign headquarters, while still bolder ones would dress up as a werewolf in a business suit and terrorize people at night in public parks and other open spaces. Many in the media speculated this was a guerrilla campaign by vampires and their supporters to make the case that only one supernatural being was the choice to be the commander-in-chief. Amelia's competition had some tricks up his sleeve. Senator Howler would invite Mrs. Lifedrain to debate him at town hall venues, but he would schedule them for daytime hours and act shocked when she didn't show up. Then he would spout out these little zingers to endear the public to him, like when he asked the other candidate how she could stand to look at herself in the mirror. Then he'd wait a second before giving that deadpan look to the audience as they caught on. He argued that under a life drain administration, the retirement age would be eliminated because vampires never age and they never worry about retirement or medical bills. He also said she would look for ways to increase the supply of blood donors for her vampire friends, such as broadening use of the death penalty or mandating blood donations by every citizen. He was right, by the way. I look like a junkie from the track marks on my arm. Weekly donations are required by law, and missing them is punishable by, you guessed it, death by exsanguination. There were some live debates between the candidates in the evening hours. In one of them, 
Some seemingly random guy in the audience ran over to the window and ripped down the curtain, letting the light of the full moon drape Center and Howler and start his transformation on live television. I'm sure that guy was in the pocket of big blood. The pundits said he saved his candidacy by keeping his composure as he changed. He didn't attack anyone in the room. He smashed through the window and ran off into the night. I bet he was embarrassed in the morning when he turned back into a human. There were reports he walked into his campaign headquarters naked with a newspaper covering his naughty bits. The headline over his privates reportedly read, Senator runs after debate fireworks. The dirty tricks didn't stop there. Some anti-vamps tried to stake out Life Drain's crypt, so to speak, but her familiars kept them from getting to her coffin. Another protester put a giant crucifix in her front yard, but one of her acolytes set it on fire, and the discussion became racial rather than immortal. At a fundraiser on a yacht, a priest showed up to bless the lake and turn it into holy water, but when he tried to push Amelia into the water, she dodged his shove and sent him in the drink instead. The media was so slanted it was ridiculous. They loved how photogenic life drain was, how she radiated when she entered a room, how she made every reporter feel like she really savored every last drop of their interviews. By comparison, the newspapers were all trying to one-up each other on Howler headlines. Howler brought to heel, or students say Howler barking up wrong tree and even roll up this paper to scold the senator. It was an absolute circus. Come Halloween, there were so many political costumes it was hard to count. Everyone was celebrating the holiday, their favorite spooky stories come to life, and the election of a lifetime. Even the kids who knocked on my door were mostly dressed in little business suits with political pins on their tiny lapels. Some made scary versions with vampire fangs and fake blood, or they would come running up to the door on all fours to beg for candy. The polls drew closer about a week before election night. A Twitter post showed a video claiming to be life drain feeding on a staffer backstage during a public appearance. The victim came forward and said he had volunteered to serve the campaign in any way he could and that he was not attacked. After a few days of mixed coverage, Amelia Life Drain held a press conference and announced that she had never once taken blood without consent and that this gotcha journalism was equivalent to secret recordings of women eating, which she argued was a form of body shaming. By election day, it was clear she had recovered from the incident and would go on to win. Senator Howler gave a concession speech in which he promised to continue his fight for the public and the environment through his senior position in the upper chamber. It was an emotional, difficult speech for him, but the media wouldn't let him have his dignity. The headline, Howler Vows to Lead Senate PAC. During the inauguration, President Life Drain refused to change tradition, aside from the ceremony being held at night. She was sworn in on a holy Bible, the skin of her hand boiling the entire time she touched it. During her inaugural address, President Life Drain said her first goal was to curtail the nation's homeless epidemic. It sounded great until we found out what her plan was to reduce their population. Soon, it was trendy to become a vampire. Every power player in Washington became nocturnal to keep a close feel on the pulse of the White House and some lobbyists even managed to get turned in order to better represent their demonic special interests. The taxation of churches was quickly approved by an appeasing legislature. The goal was obviously to close as many areas of holy ground as they could. Gone are the days of being annoyed at a Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door. Now we've got to worry it's a vampire trying to trick you into inviting them in. It's been declared a hate crime to fight back. Stakes have been outlawed and garlic is banned from being imported or grown. Some underground dispensaries can be found if you have the right connections. The hydroponic industry doesn't just support marijuana anymore. There are population control bills being debated in committees. People are starting to realize we can't let our numbers grow out of control when so many Americans are now able to live forever. Naturally, the rich got in on the action as soon as it became profitable and then they made it cool. Hollywood movies glamorize vampirism and they mock all other supernatural identities. If you think werewolves have it bad, mummies have it even worse. They get no coverage at all, the media is mum. As for zombies, they are treated marginally better since the first gentleman is a zombie. But I think it's just a marriage of convenience to solidify the undead voting block. As for swamp creatures, 
They're being erased by climate change. Witches don't even get lip service. Since they openly claimed to be around before the great unveiling, the vampires said they already had their chance to be taken seriously. It's becoming a vampire-centric nation of selfish ghouls chasing immortality and riches. I haven't slept much these past few weeks. Some of us who are still in favor of the living, not to be confused with pro-life, although we welcome anyone with a heartbeat, have banded together to form daytime vampire hunting groups. We've even got some werewolves helping us sniff out the bloodsuckers. The government calls it murder, but we call it self-preservation. I will not let my country be drained of its health, wealth, and actual blood. We have to take a stand. Stakes may be outlawed, but we are working on a plan. In a few weeks, there is a gala planned for a big art show. Many of the rich and powerful vampires will gather together to clink blood-filled glasses and toast some unholy abominations they call art. My friends and I are putting together a team that is going to take the fight to the fiends. This uprising may claim our lives, but we must put a stop to this madness. I've got a titanium neck guard, a squirt gun full of holy water, and my body will be greased with garlic oil. I'll be going in as a distraction while the real operation unfolds. Keep an eye out for our Declaration of Independence, and don't buy into the hype. This won't be a tragedy for vampires, we'll just be sending them back to the hell in which they belong. Pray for our success, and for God's sake, please stop voting for politicians who are trying to kill you. I love James more than I love life itself. I remember the day I gave birth to him. I looked at that little bundle of human in my arms with pure joy. He was beautiful with hazel brown eyes, just like his late father who, due to a thyroid disorder, passed before he was born. We got along well as just the two of us. Outside of my job, I spent nearly all my time with little James and rarely needed to entrust him to a babysitter. When he was six, he expressed an interest in the piano when he saw Great Balls of Fire on TV one evening. We bought a baby grand within a month and had a music teacher come over once a week. He was a fast learner and I could see him playing at concert halls as an adult. At school, he was no different. He was a smart, well-behaved boy all through elementary school. At parent-teacher conferences, his teachers were sure to tell me what wonderful manners he had and how he was sure to always raise his hand before speaking. He was a pleasure compared to other more rambunctious boys, they would tell me. He wasn't your typical dirt-ridden little boy either. He was practically Victorian in how prim and proper he acted. Never would there be grass stains found on his knees. Never would he have to be told to take off his shoes before entering the home. He kept himself and the area around him clean as could be. That is until recently. Ever since he started junior high, I noticed he's been messy. His hair, that is now kept longer, nearly shoulder length, is disheveled and his clothes often have holes in them. About a month ago, I politely I reminded him he was due for a haircut. The only response I received was a grunt. I looked a little closer at him and realized a shave might be in order too. At dinner, he ate his food in a hurry, often chewing with his mouth open. And let me tell you, he ate a lot, sometimes requesting third helpings of pasta and bread. When he made these requests, his mouth was often full of food. His manners had nearly fully dissolved. When I was doing the laundry, I had to use spot cleaner on his clothes for the various stains found. This was never needed before, but was another changed trait found in my previously spotless boy. On top of it all, he asked to cancel his piano lessons and now refuses to play anymore. The baby grand sits here unloved and unappreciated. Soon his temperament became apparent even to his teachers. He brought home a teacher's note that I had to sign. He had received detention for cursing at his history teacher, F word in case you're wondering. James tried to assure me it wasn't a big deal but some kind of punishment had to be doled out. I settled on grounding him for a month and hoped that would set him straight. Well, that's when he really done it. A few days after this, I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed his bedroom door slightly ajar. I looked inside and his bed appeared suspiciously flat. Out of anger at what I suspected, I ripped the blankets off the bed and confirmed he was gone. It was past midnight and his curfew was a solid 9 p.m., not to mention he was grounded. I didn't want to disturb anyone at such an hour, but I had to find out where he was and thought to call a few of his friends. As I picked up the phone, I heard a car door slam. 
I went to the front door to see him walking up the driveway. Before he had a chance to enter, I swung open the door and gasped at him under the patio light. What I saw was not what any mother would expect from a 13-year-old boy. His face was nearly completely covered in thick hair, other than a small area around his eyes. I was speechless for a moment while I stared at him. I looked past him and towards the car that dropped him off and saw a girl at the steering wheel driving off. James, what? I started. Nothing, Mom Jesus, I was just out with a friend. He responded as though everything was perfectly natural. He pushed past me. Before he could get to his room, I grabbed his arm, only to immediately let go in horror. What I felt beneath my palm was an unnatural coarseness. His arm was covered in hair. No, this was not hair, this was fur. I looked closer at his torso and I realized his shirt was torn at the neck seam. My eyes moved further down and my heart nearly stopped when I spotted what looked like a small stain of blood on his jeans. He shoved my arm away with his hand and I let out a shriek when one of his, his long nails scratched my arm. How James, you clawed me. What happened to you? Will you leave me alone? He shouted while slamming his bedroom door shut. I stood outside the door for a moment, but I was too scared to open it. Besides, I knew what I had to do. Teenage boys with this condition would only become more out of control as they developed into men. So I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. I'm now in my bedroom with my butcher knife on my lap. I know what you are thinking. You're thinking I raised him wrong. I raised a nice good boy. What he has is a disorder. The disorder is lichenism and count yourself lucky if you've never experienced it firsthand. He's nearly full werewolf now, and I know only one tried and true way to cure it. It took me 12 nights to figure out what the littlest werewolf wanted from me. I'd stand in the sheep pasture at twilight and glare at her as she crouched in the sagebrush, her unblinking golden eyes tracking my every step. My old sheepdog Zeus would bark and claw in the red dust, agitated and protective, yet too lazy to make chase. But the wolf never tried to steal a sheep. She never moved at all, at least not unless I broke her gaze and looked away for a moment. Then I'd glance back, and she'd be gone, in an instant, disappearing into the pinion and juniper trees of the hummingbird hills, that sunless thicket where the less benevolent of the gods were rumored to lurk. I'd stand quietly and listen to her mournful howl bring down the moon, a bewailing that echoed through the canyons and vibrated the dry grass beneath my feet. Kill the white man seemed to be her lament, carried on the cool night winds. Kill him. Her words confounded me. There were certainly no white men around here. Living in a remote pueblo in the desert canyon lands of northern Arizona, the only white men I ever encountered were the occasional sheriff's deputy or government agent, well-intentioned Mormon missionaries, promising a marvelous afterlife or anthropologists fascinated by our complex pantheon. All of these visitors were politely escorted away. Even still, the presence of the little wolf bedeviled me, for I quickly understood that I was the only one who had yet seen or heard her. A real wolf, Papa? My youngest daughter Ariadne asked me one morning as I told her and her sisters the story over breakfast. Or a creature quite like it, I said, finishing my cereal with one hand stirring sugar into my coffee with the other. I reckon there's a breath of something primate and conscious in there. What makes you think she's not all wolf? My middle daughter Antiope asked. She crouches in the same place every day and never looks at the sheep. She watches me alone with the saddest of eyes. Her ears flick at the sound of my voice and her own howl is unusually expressive and forlorn. But a human can't howl, my oldest daughter Arachne declared. Maybe she's a god in disguise, I said, winking at her, or their half-human child, the daughter of a wolf god, born to a human mother who feared it so much she abandoned it in the desert to die. My wife Leah suddenly dropped her coffee mug. It shattered on the floor, and I turned in surprise. I hadn't noticed her there, standing at the stove, listening to the conversation. What do you think it is, Mama? Antiope asked her, unconcerned. Leah shrugged and took a sip of her coffee from the mug in her hands. I looked, but saw no broken mug. I blinked, figuring I'd only imagined the loud smash and the fragmented splinters of earthenware. 
Isn't the Fish and Wildlife Service reintroducing gray wolves around here? She said. They're trying to clear the overpopulation of deer at the Grand Canyon. Maybe one of those wolves wandered across. Maybe, I agreed. But this one speaks to me, I think. Just like Auntie Cassandra, Ariadne said. She hears the wind speak to her in human words. It makes her twitch and fall down asleep, and behind her eyes she sees the faces of the gods who make the wind. Cassandra's mind is very ill, Leah said. Leave her alone, and leave the wolf alone. If it is a god, it's best not to meddle in whatever task it must complete. Would anyone like some coffee? The brewer steamed and hissed. The radio buzzed and hummed the morning news and the weather reports. I had to admit I couldn't dispute my wife's assertion, but I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't get the narrative out of my head, of the little cub with a mortal mother and a divine father, a child with an uncanny inclination towards turning canine when the moon rose in the sky. It brought a little spark of thrill to the slow turn of life, the life of society's outliers out among the barren rust-colored desert. Letting my imagination run wild, I thought of my son, somewhere far from home, being cared for by the spider god who called him her beloved. I gazed at my daughters, young and vulnerable, yet so untamed and wild. I thought of the human mother who might at this moment be wondering where her little half-divine wolf cub was huddling, imagining her child lost among the old trees and the voices of the night. Was she scared? Was she hungry? Was she shivering with cold in these crisp autumn evenings after the sun went down, yearning for the familiar warmth of home? I loved my own children more than anything. I understood that primal animalistic urge to protect one's defenseless offspring. My heart softened towards the staring and unmoving cub. Her origins were an enigma to me, but were she my own daughter, I'd certainly hope another parent would be there to keep a vigilant eye on her and listen to her unspoken desires. The next evening, I began to bring small scraps of mutton and elk jerky to the wolf girl. She'd cower if I walked too close, pulling back her lips to show me her gleaming white fangs. Kill the white man, she rasped in a voice like radio static. First you must eat, I whispered affectionately. Then you may kill whatever ghosts you happen to find. I was often close enough to smell her, only briefly. She carried the sweet scent of burning sagebrush and tobacco in her fur. Once, I thought I saw a single, tiny, glistening tear emerge from her sunken eye and roll down her snout. Kill him, she howled from afar. Kill what man? I asked. There is no white man here, only me, and I'm the only one who knows you're here. Why won't you let me help you? She stared, silent as ever. But she did not run from me that evening. Encouraged by her sprouting interest in being nurtured, I turned up a few old baby blankets. Within their folds, I tucked bits of fragrant lavender and soothing catnip. I left them under a pinion tree near the border to the dense forest of the Hummingbird Hills. I'd taken care of her hunger and her shivering. All I could do now was try to heal her loneliness, to take her somewhere warm and inviting, and reunite her with the family from whom she surely must have been forced to depart. But that was not to be. On the twelfth day, I was paid a visit by a deputy of the county sheriff. I was spending a lazy autumn day in the kitchen garden, checking the tall stalks of blue corn for ripeness, pulling back the husks to get a swift glimpse of their deep indigo kernels, their rare beauty as hidden and lustrous as a dragon's cache of jewels. For a moment, I imagined myself the hero of that story, slaying the dragon and stealing its bounty. He didn't see me watching him as he drove up the winding road that spiraled around the mesa on which our pueblo was perched. His clunky white pickup truck rumbled and roared across the ancient bridge of bones that connected Mercury Mesa to Jupiter Mesa and followed the dusty red road to where I stood, a fat husk gripped too tightly in my hands. Deputy Babbitt got out of the truck and faced me, covering the gun on his hip, watching my hands, avoiding my eyes. Babbitt didn't much care for people like me. We didn't much care for deputies. Sir, he nodded, trying to look casual in a place so backward and foreign to a white man. He swept off his sun-bleached cowboy hat and leaned against the hood of the truck, stubbing out his cigarette with his pale leather boot. How's everything going around the farm? How's your wife and that beehive of daughters? 
I looked over my shoulder to make sure my family was safe inside the house. I remembered then that Leah had taken the children along to see the traveling carnival in Kanab. Zeus was probably asleep in the sheep pasture. Mr. Beartooth, Babbitt said when I didn't answer. I've heard a rumor that you've spotted a wolf nearby, one that's stalking your sheep and eating your food. Rumor? I said. Gossip, certainly. There haven't been wolves around here for 50 years. You ought to know that. Who told you I'd seen a wolf? Cassandra Maldonado. She won't speak to me, but I heard her young daughter's gone missing, and I believe the girl may have been dragged away by the wolf your kids are telling everyone about. Poor Cassandra. Her daughter was all she'd had. But if there was anyone who craved utter solitude, it was Cassandra. She lived a hermetical life on the dusty outskirts of the Pueblo, with only her cows for company, and we all assumed that's the way she wanted it. I myself had always been uneasy around her, never sure what to say or where to look when I'd bring her gifts of surplus peaches, and she'd begin to yelp and swear and convulse. But we all avoided her back then. We told ourselves it was what she needed. I was vaguely sorry to hear her child was missing. I'd forgotten she had a child. I turned my back on the sheriff's deputy and back to my corn. I've told you all I know, I said to him, my fingers idly digging at the brittle husks, not knowing even what they were doing. I hoped he wouldn't see my hands shaking. I think it's time for you to leave, deputy. Babbitt was quiet for a long moment. Well, I have the feeling there's something else you're not telling me, he said, his voice as low and discordant as a rattlesnake's tail. I clenched my jaw. I waited. I opened and closed a corn husk again and again, entwining my fingers in the gossamer green tassel, feeling the taut bulge of milk beneath the swollen kernels. I glanced at the garden shears on the opposite side of the garden, imagining the crunch they'd make as they sheared off the man's nicotine-stained fingers. There was a sound of a door opening and closing. I turned around again. Deputy Babbitt was dragging a brownish-gray bundle from the bed of his truck. His hands and his white jacket were stained with its blood. I knew right away what I was seeing. Its fur was matted and dirt-clogged. Its caved inside was stained with a rust-colored smudge. Its tongue hung out of a mangled snout, and its amber eyes stared straight ahead, into my own eyes, as they always had, never breaking that line of sight. Babbitt dropped it heavily on the ground and finally stared at me forthright. Don't you ever lie to me like that again, he hissed into my face. I've just done you a favor by shooting this dangerous animal, and now I expect to be thanked, not deceived. I put my life in danger for your flock, for your wife, for your children. You don't have to like me, but you do have to respect me, that's all I ask. There are worse predators out there than this one, and you have no idea what I've done for you, to let you let you people quarantine yourselves up here without interference. My family has lived in Arizona for a century, civilizing this barren dust bowl, trying to guide your people into the modern world, and all we get back from you is suspicion and scruple. Now don't you dare take my protection for granted and ruin it for the ones that want progress and improvement. Don't you dare violate that tenuous trust I've been generous enough to give, even as I overlook your flaws. Don't you dare. I glared straight ahead, our faces so close I could smell the remains of his cigarette and his white mustache. I did not sever my gaze with his. I thought of the littlest werewolf, speaking through the silence, pleading with her eyes. He couldn't hold for long. He kicked the wolf's body with his white boot. So that's all you've got? He growled. No thanks, no gratitude. Does this dead menace mean nothing to you? You are nothing to me, I said. One day you too will lie in the sand, but you won't get a burial nearly as grand as hers. Your mouth will fill with dust and cornmeal. Your tongue will be replaced by a scorpion's tail. Your eye sockets will be the nursery for a rattlesnake's eggs. Your ribs will be made hollow by the sun and will whine in the wind like a bone flute. Is that a threat? he said, backing away, or a curse. Neither, I said. It's an expectation, an aspiration, an invocation. He gritted his teeth. Then he turned, smashed his hat back onto his head and got into his truck. I waited for him to cross the bone bridge before I turned and crouched at the side of the little wolf girl, another father's daughter, my pollen-covered fingers stroking her ears, still soft, 
still listening to words carried on a wind that blew from another world, the land of the dead. I lay there until the sun set. Then I carried her down the mesa and buried her at the edge of the sheep pasture, the place where I'd first seen her, waiting, quietly begging me to listen to her wolf words. I smudged her nose and forehead with all the corn pollen remaining on my hands, as one does to both the newly dead and the newly born, as I had done to all my children, and later to my father. Zeus watched for a while sitting on his haunches before he finally let out a low, ululating howl that echoed off the hills and resonated through the canyons and reverberated in the craters of the luminous silver moon. He led me back home, where Leah and the children had already gone to bed. In the night I woke, feeling as if I'd heard my name whispered in a dream. I rolled over to watch the moon out the window, but the clouds had gathered, covering it in a pearlescent shroud. Hephaestus, a voice called to me into the stillness and the holy dark, a voice that sounded like Cassandra's. Hephaestus, she was pregnant. Too young to be, I said, and could not contain my tears. She was only 13. Too young, I said again, too gentle to endure the... I sat straight up. Was she, was she born human, not a wolf? Fully human, Cassandra whispered, deeply loved. Who transformed her? The voice was silent. I looked down at Leah, asleep next to me, untroubled by the whispers. I wondered if I had only dreamt the conversation, for immediately it was lost in the haze of linear time, just like the coffee mug that had never shattered. Soon I too slept again, a restless doze that allowed my mind to walk barefoot across the desert sands, leaving no footprints wandering under a swiftly spinning sky whose stars had no names. The following morning, I found the body of Deputy Babbitt at the far end of the sheep pasture. He had been scalped, flayed, and disemboweled, his entrails making spirals and curlicues in the dust. His throat had been torn out, left in bloody tatters of oozing, putrefying shreds of flesh. His genitals had been torn almost completely from his body, left dangling and mangled. His toenails and fingernails had been yanked out of their bleeding cuticles. His mouth, open in an eternal scream of agony, was stuffed with dried sagebrush and cactus thorns. His rib cage, splayed open to reveal a half-eaten heart and lungs, made a wailing, keening noise that swelled and receded with the icy wind. I looked at my fingertips, again dusted with corn pollen. Then I wiped my hands on my jeans and did not touch the dead man's forehead. From afar, I felt myself being watched. I turned. Watching me from the other side of the fence was an enormous wolf with green eyes that wept human tears. Its fur was black all over, like a person in mourning. It gazed at me not with fear or caution as the young one had, but with attentive rage. Who are you? I asked, holding its gaze, my hand on the hunting knife at my hip. It ought to be your wife lying there in the dirt, rotting alongside the man said the black wolf, in a voice like the whispers I had heard in the clouded night. Your dispute is not with Leah, I said. She's done nothing wrong. Leah never asked my permission to transform my daughter, said the black wolf. She acted hastily, and by the time I found out what happened, she could not undo what she had done. My Ida didn't have to die. She didn't have to suffer in the cold night, alone and starving, wondering why this perversion had been put up on her. I don't understand, I said. I loved my daughter, I loved her. She was all I had. I would have loved her baby, in a way that nobody in this desert ever loved me. You've all rejected and abandoned me, forced me to live far away from everyone. You hated Ida for her slow mind and slow speech. You hated me for the way I twitched and fainted, yet still I had no desire to be a wolf. Magic in the hands of one with an unsound mind is perilous. But when the deputy came around talking rumors about my Ida, I transformed myself anyway to be close to my little one forever. And now it's too late. You've all killed her. The black wolf stepped closer to me. Leah stole something from me in more ways than one. She stole it to carry out her private vengeance on the white man. But my own vengeance is not complete. Warn your wife that when I see her again, I will tear her apart piece by piece. I will prolong her suffering for years as I replace her human body with this wolf's body. I refuse to become human again until I've been satisfied. 
Then she stood on her hind legs, becoming as tall and straight-backed as the tallest human. She bolted into the overgrown woods of the Hummingbird Hills, to where the sun refused to shine. I confronted Leah that night by the fireplace. Don't keep secrets from me like that, I said softly, restraining my impatience, my indignation. I had every right, she said. It's not the first and won't be the last. Why, Leah? Why did you turn Ida into a wolf? You're not a shaman or a witch. You have no right to be using magic against a child. Why would you do something so contemptible? Leah was listening to a record of Bach violin sonatas while she drank watermelon wine straight from the bottle. Its sweet smell could not overtake the steely scent of blood that saturated the room. She set it down, hard, on the wooden floor and looked me straight in the eye. I was protecting Ida when Cassandra showed me the black moth encased in amber, a gift she'd claimed to have been given by the wolf god White Paws. She swore it would turn me into a wolf. I could finally kill Babbitt with no consequences, as I had wanted to do for so long. But I found that I couldn't. I had too much to lose. I have a home, and children, and a job. Instead, when I saw Ida was pregnant, I gave the piece of amber to her and changed her into a wolf. I forbade her from telling her mother, and I sent her out into the desert to hunt that lowlife scum. Protecting her from what? You seem to have tied a knot even you cannot untangle. I told you Ida was pregnant. Who do you think was the father of her child? And who do you think is Ida's father too? The deputy, I said, suddenly feeling small and simple for not making the connection until now. Ida had always been more light-skinned than the rest of us, and we had mistrusted her because of it. What an abomination for a man to beget a child on his own daughter. I gave Ida a gift, Leah continued, the gift of carrying out vengeance, the only gift I could give that would match the generosity of a wolf god. I would have wanted that privilege for myself years ago. I was younger than she when Babbitt raped me, and my rage had a knife's edge. I raged because I was powerless and his power is so unbounded that he killed Ida anyway, not to protect himself from the accusation, but because he could. Eventually, he would have found some other girl to victimize, and then what would we do? Turn all our girls into a colony of bats? Would you want to see your own daughters hanging upside down in a cave all day, unable to live a beautiful life in the sunshine? I admit I used magic that did not belong to me, and which I had no right to try to control. But you need to understand that I only intended to protect the girl. I told Ida she must be the one to slay Babbitt, to force him to look into her eyes in the moment of his death, to regret his actions, to understand that the consequences were finally catching up with him. And once he was dead, I promised Ida I would find a way to make her human again. She never had the heart to kill him, I said. Too gentle a soul, abused until she had no will of her own, too meek to stain her teeth with blood. Her blood is on your hands. Hephaestus, Leah said, again changing the subject. What about your role? Ida was begging you to kill the deputy, the white man, the white man in the white truck with the white hat and the white boots. Why didn't you do it? Once you saw that she had failed to take him down, he was here the day she was shot. You didn't tell me. But I could smell his scent all over the ground when I arrived home. Nobody would have seen you cut his throat. Nobody would have known. The gods would have devoured the body and protected you from the consequences, had you asked. Why didn't you avenge me, avenge Ida, avenge all his past and future victims? Why didn't you listen to her cries? You overlooked her human desires and ignored what she was saying with her human voice. You treated her like some spoiled household dog who only wants a bed and a belly rub. Don't lay the burden of shame on me, I said. You misled me. You told me she was an ordinary wolf and to leave her alone. How could I have known Ida would fail? Clearly I'm not as clever or powerful as you think me to be. Leah scowled. A child is dead, she said. And all you care about is shifting the blame to anyone but yourself. You sound an awful lot like Babbitt right now. You're wrong, I fumed. I have been humbled, Leah, and I believe you are the merciless one. You used magic stolen from a vulnerable mother and left a little girl in a body she didn't want. 
You forced a child to fight your battle, and now Cassandra will be forever stalking you. She has her caning stare fixed on you, on your every move. One day, she'll pounce and take her revenge on you, and she will tear you apart piece by piece, year after year, and replace your body with a wolf's, and I will never be powerful enough to protect you. I can't. The blanket around her shoulders fell. She quickly pulled it back up, but not before I saw a flash of the gray-brown of a wolf's furry foreleg, hastily stitched onto the bleeding stump of her elbow with greasy sinew. I looked up from the fresh wound. I met her eyes. She glared back at me, eyes fiery, but I could not hold her gaze. I bent my head and I hid my face in my hands. It had been too long since I've done this. I think as I walk out of the master bath, what I'm about to do is good for one's soul, if they had one still. This is the first time I've been alone in the house since I moved in. Dripping wet still, I press play on my CD player. Thanks to the supernatural house-wide stereo system, Jason and Julian whipped together a while back, the thunderous beat of Stargazer by Rainbow begins. This song is the most majestic expression of the human condition. It is perfect in every way. I start headbanging and spinning around. I imagining I'm singing in front of a hundred thousand people. I put all my effort into this. Dio deserves no less. I jump on my bed and act like I'm on a riser on the stage. The hairbrush microphone is projecting my lip syncing to the masses. I jump off the bed and put my foot on Gumdrop like he is a floor monitor. As I sing, where do we go? He wags his tail. He doesn't know what I'm doing, but he supports my life choices. I head down the stairs, feet together, jumping to the beat. Boom, 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 boom. Over and over again till I get to the first floor. Spinning like a headbanging devilish, I go to the kitchen. Gumdrop rushes past me. I pay him no mind. I'm lost in the music and emotion of the song. As the solo fades, I hop on the coffee table in the sitting room next to the kitchen. No, I'm no longer channeling Dio. Now I'm the main character in the song. With every once of passion I have, I sing shaking with the effort. I point to the distance as Dio screams, look. Over and over again, I raise the horns and bend my body backwards at the part where he sings the rainbow rising part. I hop off the table while headbanging. I bend over at the waist, putting my whole body into it as I sing, going home. The song fades and I'm out of breath and slightly sweaty. Sometimes the rock gods demand a sacrifice like sweating after they just got out of the shower, a price I am willing pay. From my side, I hear, ha <laughs> ha ha, fuck me. I look over to see Jason, Snowflake, and Gumdrop looking at me through the open doorway. Recently, Gumdrop has figured out how to open the French doors with his paws. Snowflake is beside himself. Jason looks at me, stone-faced. He slowly raises his arm at the elbow and gives me the horns. He stays like that for a few seconds, and he lowers his hand and leaves without saying a word. Snowflake does his version of headbanging as he continues to laugh. Then he follows Jason. Gumdrop stays and looks at me as he sits. A2 Gumdrop? He starts wagging his tail. I point at him. Oh no, kiss my bare ass. I'm so mad at you right now. I look over and see Bourdain with his claw and some batter. Could have warned me, dude. He says something in his hissing language and continues mixing. Well, that cow has definitely left the barn. I stand there naked with my hands on my hips. The breeze feels nice. Hours later, I pull up at Talbot's and shut Lily off and wait. I don't have to wait long before the girls run out of the house and hop in. Ready? Oh yeah. Cynthia answers. Mercy just nods and climbs in the back seat. Cynthia continues her verbal onslaught. Lunch and hanging in the park? This is sweet. Thanks for letting us camp at the lake. So much fun. We skinny dipped. Oh, I caught a rabbit. So good. What? Oh, she caught it in wolf form. Keep in mind, I still haven't started Lily up. Cynthia is talking at Mach 2 and showing no signs of slowing down. Then we had a fire. Henry, as usual, had the foresight of bringing s'mores stuff. So like him, right? 
I have no idea who Henry is. We talked and Sandy pulled out her guitar and like did covers of classic rock bands like Tool. So much fun. I can't sing too well, but I make up for it with enthusiasm. Put your seatbelt on. Oh, okay. Safety first. I mean, I can take a lot of damage, but who wants to walk around for a couple days with a busted face? Know what I mean? I don't get a chance to answer. Of course you don't. You're a human, a badass one at that, but still human. Just for the record, I just want you to know I like hanging out with you senior citizen types like Dad. Mercy sighs. Excuse me? I'm barely ten years older than you. If that... That's a huge ten years. So brave of you walking around with your hips and whatnot. Don't make me put you in the trunk! Mercy snorts. Cynthia laughs. Let's get some lunch, hope you brought your false teeth. I'm going to backhand you with my liver-spotted hand. She laughs harder. Werewolves and teenage werewolves in particular are rambunctious by nature, which includes a fair amount of ball busting. With this round over, I start Lily and I pull out. We pull up to Esmeralda's and are greeted by the woman herself. Cynthia decides this is a good time to try out her Spanish. Esmeralda answers her and a new victim of Cynthia's rampage is born. Mercy and I hang back as we walk. I elbow her in the arm. How you doing? All right. I know she wants her space. I get that. I also get that she still wants people. Well, people she likes to show interest. We sit down in order. We spend the next hour or so eating and talking. Cynthia does most of the heavy lifting in the talking department. Overall, it was outstanding. My burrito was excellent as usual. After lunch and a half hour later, we are pulling into the park's parking lot. I chose this park because I know they are girls, but they are werewolves too. If they wanted, the park is big enough where they could change and run around. As we head towards the trailhead, Cynthia takes off. I'll be back. Got to use the bathroom. We'll go ahead. That's cool. With those hips, you won't get far, Cynthia says over her shoulder as she runs. I turn to Mercy. I'm going to smack your sister. She smiles, which is no small feat. I'm kind of okay with that. We laugh as we walk. To my surprise, Mercy begins talking. Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. Where did you get your scars? Like your hand and stuff. Her asking about my scars I get. Most of them like my arm and new shoulder. Scars are out in the open. My hand, however, is different. She has had to look closely at me just to see it. Very close attention. Well, my hand is from witches. They were going to sacrifice me and during the scuffle of my escape I grabbed a knife near the fire. What kind of witches? The kind that worship a mad god. Mercy mulls this over. That's crazy. A lively night for sure. What about your arm? Those are from primordial vampires. You killed a primordial vampire? Well, I personally didn't. It was a test, and I was helping a dear friend with it. What kind of whack-ass test has vampires? A test for a potential voodoo priest or priestess. Voodoo priest? You know a voodoo priest? One day when you are old like me, you will have cool friends too. Mercy smiles. I hope so. You will? I say, putting a hand on her shoulder. So how did he kill the vampire? While I fought the vampire, he conjured a spell. That where the scars come from. When the vampire attacked him, he did the spell. Crushed the vampire alive. I will remember the screams for the rest of my life. They were haunting. Jesus. That was a lively day too. You're badass. I don't know about all that. I was just trying to survive. That's what all badasses say. If you say so. Mercy and I keep walking. I can tell she wants to talk. I say nothing and keep walking. She will say something when she is ready. Can I ask you something else? Guess she is ready. Yup. Are you going to continue fucking my dad? Wub, what? I mean, this chick doesn't talk much, but when she does, it packs a wallop. I know. I smelled you on him the next morning when he came to the lake to get us. She is part wolf. I never considered that. Ah, uh, well, I just want you to know it's cool. 
I just want nobody to get hurt, that's all. Thank you, for what it's worth. I think it was a one-time thing. I mean, we may do it again later, but I doubt it. That is the most honest answer I have for you. Okay, I can live with that. From your tone, I take it you're not comfortable with werewolf romances? Nailed it. Delicate, but to the point. Yes and no, I don't really care. Honestly, I don't care what my alphas do. For me, I don't like it. Since birth, I have had to share everything, even more so as a twin. I just want one thing that is mine, and only mine. Well, well, well. Look who is more human than they think. Mercy smiles and blushes. She hits me with her shoulder. Shut up. So do you have a dude that's all yours? Her face turns so red I think it may explode. Yeah, it's been a couple weeks, but I really like him. I lean over and whisper. I have the highest confidence that you will fight off the other bitches and have him to yourself. She smile again. I like to think so. At this moment, Cynthia runs up and smacks my ass hard as she runs by. What's up, bitches? Got further than I thought. Well, Granny can make good time if she wants. Cynthia laughs as she turns around and runs around me in circles, smacking my ass several times as she does. Good for you. Would you stop? I say, batting her hands away. Cynthia is one of those people bursting with life. It's like she is the hero in her own action movie. Quick to laugh, quick to love, and if the circumstances warrant it, quick to fight. What took you so long? Mercy asks. Oh, I took a big nasty shit. Ew, Cynthia. Cynthia laughs. She is also a fan of poop and fart jokes. Now we can start our hike. I'm sure Mercy held your rapt attention so far. Actually, we had a nice girl talk. Cynthia looks back as she walks ahead of us. p p p t, -t I'm sure. As if. The hike was awesome. After a couple hours, we start heading back. As we neared a picnic area, you know, one of those areas with BBQs, shelters, and some swing sets. When we get near, we hear gunshots. Get down! I, I put my arms around the girls and force them to the ground. What the hell was that? Cynthia asks. Quiet. We watch a group of people enter the picnic area. They are dressed in black paramilitary gear complete with gas masks. Who are they? I don't know, Cynthia. Quiet. The paramilitary people round up everyone in the picnic area. What are we going to do? Now is not the time for 20 questions, Cynthia. Also, on a side note, under no circumstances can Jason find out about this. We are going to watch and do some recon. We can't just go in there and behead them. Why not? Asks Mercy. Excuse me? We go in there and disembowel them. Let them die laying on their intestines. No, we do this my way. There are innocent people in there. They are more important. Understand? I need you to say, you understand. I understand, Cynthia answers. Understood. Mercy says, barely containing the wolf inside of her. Okay, let me think. I say, watching the paramilitary group. One of my patented stupid ideas pop in my mind. This is what we will do. You two sweep the perimeter. If they have anybody out there, you herd them in the area. Do not kill them unless you have to. What are you going to do? Cynthia asks. I'm going to try to get the hostages released. Mercy makes a face. Without your guns? Yes, if they see my guns, which I don't have, they will shoot me. What if they hurt you? Cynthia asks, worry in her voice. If I get in trouble, I will yell attack. Then what? Good question, Cynthia. Attack. Leave none alive but only after the hostages are released. I nod and leave the bushes. I run into the area yelling, Gumdrop! Goomdroop! The paramilitary group turns around, pointing guns at me. Whoa, just looking for my chihuahua. I don't want any trouble. Too late for that. Get over here. I raise my hands and walk towards them. The leader, I assume, throws me to the ground. Bind her. Hey man, there is no need for that. Shut up. The man with the rope says before he smacks me. He picks me back up and binds my wrists tightly. Now I just need to wait. A few minutes later, I hear the girls howl. What was that? Wolves? There are no wolves here. You would be surprised, I say. Shut up, the leader screams at me. There is some gunshots. My body tightens. 
I pray the girls are okay. My prayers are answered when a person comes out of the forest running. Within a couple minutes, three more people run in. What's going on? The leader asks. Wolves. Huge fucking wolves. They chased us here. All of you? The four of them nod. The girls must be bored just chasing people and hearing them like sheep. Shit, man, they are fast. I tried to shoot one but missed. Okay, my turn. Hey, let these people go. And why would I do that? I alone is more valuable than all of these people combined. Why is that? I personally know the mayor. No way, one of the paramilitary people says. We need all of them to start the war, another one says. She no or you could kill me in front of her. Think about it, cameras, lights, the whole package. The leader steps towards me. Or I could kill all of you now. You could kill these no-names with no fanfare or kill the mayor's personal friend on live TV. The choice is yours. Again? What's to keep me from doing all of that without your help? If you try to contact the mayor, I assure you she won't talk to you. She will coordinate the police and set up UAT from her office. If I call her, she will come. Why would you do that? I just want to keep these people safe. No one else has to die here. You want to die alone? In the distance, I see Cynthia poke her head out of some bushes. I slightly shake my head, no, and she pulls back. I'm not alone as you think. The leader thinks about my proposal. One of his people challenges him. You're not considering this, are you? No plan survives contact. We've been given an opportunity we didn't account for. How is one person going to start the war? A high-profile one like her could. The leader turns to the hostages. Leave. The hostages hesitates. Leave or die. The hostages get up and start running. No fucking way. One of the paramilitary people screams as they lift their rifle. The leader pulls out a handgun and shoots him in the head. Anyone else disagree with my decision? The rest shake their heads. I turn and watch the hostages. They all make it to their cars and take off. Good. They are safe and we are alone. Call the mayor. The leader demands. Sure. First tell me some info. She will want to know. Like what? What is your group's name? We are called the Lost. Why do you want to sacrifice these people? To start the war. What war? To purge the planet of the weak and unworthy. Who falls into that category? Everyone, not us. People will join or die. What god or gods are you doing this for? There is no god or gods. We are alone in the universe. There is nothing before birth, nor nothing after death. Fuck. I've been dealing with the supernatural for so long I forgot normal humans can be evil. I cannot allow this group's message to get out. Not that I was anyway. Attack! Nothing happens. Who are you commanding to attack? No one. When I'm stressed, I blurt out stuff. It's a nervous tick. There is movement along the sides of the picnic area. Go check it out, the leader commands. Two people split up and check out the movements. When each one gets near the bushes, they are attacked and dragged back into the shrubbery, screaming, Smart girls. The group yells and fires into the woods. Eventually, the gunfire is replaced by clicks. Damn it. I did not command you to fire. Now you have no ammo left. The leader screams at his people. These brainiacs are trying to take over the world. They aren't even smart enough to bring enough ammo. Sorry, Supreme Leader. The leader, I'm not calling him Supreme Leader, smacks the follower. You will be. The girls howl. The followers become frightened. Grab her. We will do this at a different location. Before one of the assholes could touch me, the girls attack. Several of the followers fire their guns, but they only click. The leader pulls his handgun out and aims it at Mercy. I jump up and shoulder block him. We both hit the ground. He rolls over and points the gun in my face. Goodbye. I close my eyes. I hear him scream and gunfire. I open my eyes. The leader's shot was broken up my Mercy. She is on his chest, ripping his throat out. I roll over and see Cynthia lock jawing on a follower and throw him in the air. I get up and run. I am still tied up, but I can still help. I drop kick one follower and run into another. 
The girls might not need my help after all. Every bite is focused. They just don't bite the thigh. They bite hard enough to sever the artery inside of it. One follower starts running and Cynthia takes off after him. He dies tired and screaming. I watch Cynthia drag him to the ground and bite his neck, snapping it. Before I know it, all of the followers are dead. Mercy and Cynthia change back to Human. Their hands and face are covered in blood. Thank you, I say as Mercy starts untying me. Why you thanking me? You saved my life. Just paying you back. He had a clear shot at me and you knocked it wild. Still thank you. Mercy smiles as she finishes untying me. Now what? Cynthia asks. Go get cleaned up and put on your clothes. I'll call the police. The girls nod and take off and run back to the forest. My plan almost fails. The hostages called the police the second they were free. The girls barely made it back before the picnic area was swarmed by police. I tell the police the followers were attacked by wolves. I added the wolves looked sickly and maybe rabid. That tidbit got me an evil side-eye from the girls. Louise came as the police was investigating. The EMT had just checked me out when she showed up. Since we have a moment, I have a few questions. Ask. Now, wolf attacks are unknown here. Was this a normal attack or a changing one? Why would that matter? Cynthia asks. Well, young lady, if this was an attack by supernatural means, I can sway the investigation or hunt. If this was a normal attack, I have to allocate resources to tracking down these sick animals and stopping the threat to the populace. I don't like giving away the girl's secrets, but I have no choice. To be fair, Louise has shown great discretion when it comes to me and those around me, namely Snowflake. Mercy answers before I can. There is no threat to the populace, I promise you. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Now I know how to deal with this. Now if you ladies excuse us, I need to talk to Faust alone. I hand over the keys to the girls and tell them I will be there soon. The girls leave and Louise turns to me. Werewolves? Yeah, they are here. How many? I've never taken a count, but I would say well over a hundred. Louise folds her arms. Jesus, are they a threat? No, not at all. Why are they here? Um, to protect me. Well, I will say they are good at their job. Did someone send them? Do you really want the answer to that? No, not really. If you vouch for them, that's good enough for me. Good. So have you gotten any information on these people? A little. We raided the leader's house 15 minutes ago. The police found a mishmash of stuff. Writings about cleansing the world and only the worthy being left. The writings are cherry-picked from different religions and philosophers. They honestly thought what they would do today was going to start a war tomorrow. Detectives are on their way to catalog and collect evidence. A quick background check showed the leader was recently unemployed and his wife left and took the kids six months ago. He was alone until... He channeled his rage and found others like him. Yes, Louise and I watched the bodies get bagged and taken away. So sad. One broken man found others like him and they all died because of his rage. Louise leans in. On a side note, Maddie would like her friend to spend the night. Would that be okay? I think so. I'll talk to Jason and see if they got anything going on. Maddie will be thrilled. Louise puts a hand on my shoulder. Faust, the city owes you and the girls a gratitude of debt. You three saved a lot of people today. I'm just glad we were here to help. Louise smiles and leaves to do some mayor stuff. I get up too and leave. Nobody has said anything to me, so I guess I'm good to go. I walk back to Lily and hop in. As I start Lily, Cynthia smiles and says, you geezers know how to party. Get in the trunk. It doesn't matter where I'm employed as a park ranger. What does matter is my secret job, the thing that I do when I'm off the grid, so to speak. A werewolf started appearing about six months ago, and I'm still not sure why. At first, we got calls from visitors saying they encountered grizzly bears, or something approximating one deep in the forest. For the first few months, we got maybe a dozen calls. After that, 
things really started to ramp up, daily, or rather, nightly, sightings. Despite that, no one could really get a good look at the thing everyone assumed to be Bear. Then my boss showed up, a man I rarely saw. He tossed a Trank dart gun at me and told me to head into the woods. Whatever you do, don't kill the thing. Based off the information we've been able to gather, this is no damn bear. Something possibly supernatural. Does this have anything to do with Elijah's disappearance last month? Something killed Elijah and we never found the body. James only gave a slight nod, something that could be denied later if asked. The less you know the better, Liam. Just take your truck and head into the woods. I'll mark the most recent sighting on your map, James said, crossing his arms and giving me a look that told me not to ask any more questions, but I couldn't help myself. Guess some weird government agency is involved in this if you're telling me not to kill it. You'd think the safety of the visitors would come first, I said, but James cut me off. Now officially, that's none of our business, Liam. Just taking orders. You'd be wise to do the same. So I closed my mouth and got to work, loading my vehicle with some last minute things I thought I might need, food, water, binoculars. Then I got in the truck and drove down the winding road. I decided to not get on the walkie because I didn't want to alert James. My plan was this, pick up Bill, my partner in crime more or less, at his usual patrolling location, then head off to where the location James marked on the map and see if we couldn't tag team this thing. I caught Bill just sitting in his patrol truck reading an Agatha Christie novel and smoking a cigarette. I remember him telling me how relaxing he found it. Being out here, not a care in the world, tending to his biological needs, the cigarette, and the needs of his higher brain, the Agatha Christie novel. Hey Bill, we got a situation James wants us to look into. Bill looked up from his novel, mildly irritated. What kind of situation? Got a trank something, you know, that thing that everyone thinks is a bear, but probably isn't. Why trank instead of kill? Yeah, I was wondering that too. Anyway, hop in, good buddy. We got a long night ahead of us, and that's putting it really fucking mildly. Bill got in and we drove off in the direction of the last sighting. I filled Bill in on what little I knew. Guess the thing that really concerns me is why now? Why a month after Elijah's death? Bill asked, thumbing through the book in his hands but not really reading it. Yeah. That caught my attention too, I don't know the reason. I just know that something fishy is going on. Then that's when we saw it. A large, hairy beast. Running on all fours, then randomly standing upright and roaring. Our headlights seemed to confuse the thing. Bill took out his pistol, rolled down the window and fired. Bill, what the fuck are you doing? No lethal force is allowed on this thing. We gotta use the trank gun. The thing, which upon closer inspection looked exactly like a werewolf, just roared and charged at the truck, grabbing its bottom and shaking it violently until Bill and I were completely disoriented. It then leapt into the trees. What the fuck is wrong with you, I said to Bill again once my head stopped spinning. I said no lethal weapons. Sorry, Liam, just got rattled is all. Wasn't going to get turned to human paste because a pair of government-issue sunglasses told us not to us actual bullets, Bill replied, face flushed. Well, after that, I began to drive again, keeping our eyes peeled for the werewolf. We heard howls coming from the infinite line of trees to our left. No matter how much we combed the woods, we didn't find anything. This went on for several nights, experiencing horrific sightings of the massive man-wolf. I went by myself after the first night because I didn't trust Bill not to fire bullets at the thing. James was ripping me a new ass because I couldn't track the damn thing down, at least not keep it in my sights long enough to track it. On the fourth night, I sat in my truck on the side of a wide road, scanning the eerily still line of palm trees. My ears pricked as I heard the soft crunch of twigs as tired crushed them. I peeked in the rearview mirror and saw a sleek black car parking behind me. A short woman with red hair came out of the car, using precise movements so that not one ounce of energy was wasted. Are you Liam? The woman asked, popping into my window like she was a cop about to give me a ticket. I heard the trees rustle behind her and began to perspire a little on my forehead. I'd tell you that you shouldn't be out this way, ma'am, since we've seen had a few bear sightings out this way, but I started. I don't mean to be blunt, but I outrank park rangers. Again, not trying to be a jerk, just stating a fact. 
The woman seemed fairly young, and her smile sent a shiver down my spine because it was so emotionless. She explained to me what was going on. She worked for a government agency, one I hadn't heard before, and they had been working on a serum to reverse the transformation of the werewolf. They were hoping I could sedate the thing before it did any real damage or chose to move on to an even broader wilderness. There has been a reason why this werewolf has been so good at evading you, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with it having preternatural abilities, the woman said. She finally introduced herself as Sarah Perkins. Here, take this trank gun. It comes with a special tranquilizer that will not only sedate the werewolf, but also hopefully reverse his transformation. It hasn't been tested on his kind, since we believe he is the only one of his kind that exists, Sarah said and handed me a much larger gun than I had which had a small tube filled with yellow liquid fitted onto the top. She had one for herself too. We hurried into the woods, following the howls until I felt like we were dangerously close. Sarah scanned the environment, looking more vigilant than nervous. Okay, maybe a little nervous, but she hid it remarkably well. As for me, I was terrified, not afraid to admit that since I didn't have special government training to deal with a friggin' werewolf, the trees all around us began to rustle and before I could really get my bearings, the massive hairy beast shot from the top of one of the trees and landed on the ground. My hands shook. I tried to steady my gun except my nerves wouldn't let me. Steady, I said. Steady. But I just couldn't calm my shaking hands. The beast slowly moved closer on all fours, fierce yellow eyes fixed on me. A pound of drool must have escaped from its jaws hanging from them in thick, disgusting streams that made me want to vomit. It swiped the air with massive claws, growling. Just as I thought I was a goner, I heard the sound of a whisper whizzing by at about a hundred miles an hour, landing in the beast's hairy, bulging neck. Without thinking, I fired my own gun. The dart landed in the thing's abdomen. It growled weakly and collapsed onto the ground. Sarah didn't waste any time. She ran toward the thing and placed a small chip deep into the fur of its right arm. Tracking device, she said as its breathing slowed. The trank transformation dart did what she claimed. The beast began to shrink. The fur started to go back into the skin. It all happened so quickly that at first, I didn't believe what I was seeing. I went over to the man who shivered and rubbed his arms. The transformation had taken a toll on him. It took me a minute, but I recognized the man. Elijah, I said under my breath. You're alive. How is this even possible? Well, congratulations, Sarah, a man's voice said from behind. You got to subject X first. You won the bet. I turned around. Bill. Bill, what is going on? I asked, tone clearly frazzled. Sarah jumped in. We work at the same agency. We had a little bet going. Whoever got to the werewolf first could do with it as it pleased. Kill it, or trank it, and put a tracking device on it. Of course, my way aligned with the agencies. Bill here is a renegade, wants to eliminate everything in sight. Bill gave a soft chuckle. Well, guess I got what I want either way, Bill said, grinning and patting me on the back as he walked past me. He knelt in front of Elijah and seemed to pluck one of the remaining werewolf hairs from one of its forearms and put it in a small glass vial. Then Sarah and Bill seemed to be talking in code, and I couldn't at all parse what they were saying. Bill came up to me afterward. Okay, Liam. We better get out of here before that trank dart wears off. Looks like the serum's effects were only temporary. It'll completely change back into werewolf form in less than 15 minutes. Part of the transformation has already begun. The sedative will wear off in about 10 after that. But don't worry. We can track the thing with the device Sarah put on it. So we all left, Sarah in her sleek government vehicle, and Bill and I in our park ranger truck. You can't tell James that I work for a government agency that hunts a werewolf, he said. Now I wanted to kill the thing, wipe it off the map, but Sarah had other plans. I have to respect the bet, I lost, she won. Which means that Elijah will be roaming the woods and we have to track him every night, study him. After a while, once the agency has all the information it needs, it will either give a kill order and I can deliver a bullet to the thing's brain, or it will come up with a serum that will permanently erase Elijah's werewolf tendencies. So with Bill's help, I track Elijah every night. 
using regular trank darts to sedate him. We take hair and skin samples, put everything into stainless steel containers that get shipped back to a secret government lab. They are working on a serum just like Bill said, one which will be permanent. I've learned to accept Bill's new identity, aspiring werewolf killer. I'll deal with it when the time comes. I think I have additional problems to the fate of Elijah because I've gone to the workman's cabin, seeing Bill with those strange yellow eyes more than once. I'm not sure if he is a full-fledged werewolf, because he's been with me every night, and I just see him in his human form, except sometimes as we are driving along, I'll see his eyes turn yellow under the deep shadows cast by the moon. Something is clearly different. Did the sample he took from Elijah that night have something to do with it? I feel trapped in this situation. Bill seems something else besides human, and I can't abandon my post without making him suspicious. I also don't want to abandon my post because I feel like I have a duty to the visitors here to keep this werewolf at bay. And I do agree with Sarah. Given the circumstances, I don't feel comfortable ending the life of a fellow park ranger. Bill's a relative newcomer, and I worked with Elijah for years before he disappeared. I don't want to give up on a fellow ranger. My name is Amish. I am a 21-year-old college student living on the outskirts of city name omitted. My dad had bought this house ahead of time, planning for my college, and I was grateful for that. He had installed metal security screens on all the windows and door to prevent intruders from getting into the house since it was isolated, with the nearest neighbors being more than three miles away. There was a woods-like area, less than a 100 meters from my house, and I often visited it with some of my college's friends. We started campfires, got stoned and just chilled in the woods. We never encountered any wild animals except maybe a wild dog or a monkey here or there, but nothing too threatening. Yesterday, my friends came over. It was my birthday. We got drunk, danced, ordered a shit ton of pizzas and enjoyed ourselves. After the majority of my friends had left and only my best friends remained, we decided that it'd be best if they slept over. At 1 a.m., we decided to go into the woods start a campfire and enjoy beer while playing spin the bottle and giving each other dares. We started off with stupid dares like DMing exes and posting weird tweets. And since none of us were of the imaginative kind, we were having a really good time fooling around. Eventually, my friend Mike dared him me to go into the woods and click a picture on the far end of the woods. I wasn't in the mood to get bit by a wild insect or to get chased by a wild dog and couldn't even think straight so I asked Mike to give me some other dare and stop being silly. They all chuckled and imitated a chicken. You aren't so tough after all big guy, are you? Said Katie in between snickers. I was frustrated. Screw you guys. I whispered under my breath before getting up and walking into the woods. I had my phone on me, so I used its flashlight to navigate through the forest. While I was in the middle of the woods, surrounded by trees and bushes, I noticed motion in my peripheral vision. I looked straight towards the bush through which I noticed the movement and started walking towards it. I could not see a thing. As soon as I walked into the bush, I heard a low growl and the sounds of quick, heavy footsteps. I walked through the bushes but found nothing, no one. Yeah, super funny, guys. I looked around and exclaimed in the darkness. Now that I look back at it, doing this while drunk wasn't the best idea, to be honest, since I would have grabbed the attention of all the creatures nearby. I dismissed it as a wild puppy or a bunny or something and continued walking deeper into the woods. I arrived at the end of woods and turned off my phone's flashlight, then took a selfie. I quickly snapped a few more photos before starting back to the campfire. It was 2.30 a.m. by now, and I was more than halfway through to my friends. I had this sudden urge to check out how the photos actually looked, so I unlocked my phone and looked through to the photos. To my horror, there was a deer mangled deer carcass hanging from a tree. Its eyes were slashed right out. Blood poured from its stomach, or what remained of its stomach, its back had a giant bit more, resembling that of a dog or a wolf. I threw up at the horrid sight. How could have I not noticed it, I thought to myself. I continued to walk towards the campfire, now getting both scared and desperate. Just before the campfire was in sight, I heard roaring and people crying out for help. When I connected the dots in my head, I came to a disturbing realization. I ran as fast as I could towards the sounds, 
only to see three of my friends' headless mangled bodies around the campfire. All their bodies were mangled. I saw Mike running towards the house before I could even fully process what was happening. A bipedal wolf-like creature came sprinting down. It dug its claws in Mike's back. I heard him shriek before the creature put its jaws around his neck and snapped his neck clean in half. I closed my eyes and ran backwards, back into the woods. I couldn't watch the whole ordeal and was pretty sure that the creature had noticed me. Because of the darkness, I could not make out any features of the creature except a long snout with giant fangs and the pale green color of its skin. It stood almost at nine feet tall and had talon-like claws in both its hands. Something in my heart told me to run and climb a tree since I knew damn well I could not outrun it. I quickly climbed up a tree and hid within its large leaves peeking through them. I could see it pass by every couple of seconds, probably looking for me. At 4 a.m. I decided to climb down and run to my house since I hadn't seen it for a good 15 minutes. I took a deep breath and then sprinted towards my house. My heart skipped a beat when I realized a pair of footsteps had followed me. I heard it growl and braces for impact. I knew it had lunges towards me. It jumped on top of me and let out a blood-curdling screech. I could now see its face clearly. It had clear blue eyes and grayish-green fur on its face. It looked like a wolf but had a much muscular frame. I felt suffocated under its weight. My life flashed before me. Babe, I closed my eyes, just hoping and praying it'd kill me in one swift blow. But then it got off me and roared. I stood up quickly to see another werewolf charging towards the clear blue-eyed one. This other werewolf has glowing red eyes and white fur. It looked taller than the one trying to attack me, but was definitely lighter. They locked claw and bit down on each other. A purple liquid, what I assumed to be their blood, splattered everywhere. Their collision gave me enough time to run to my house. As soon as I entered, I noticed that the house was in ruins. The metal screens were broken and blood was smeared on the walls. I immediately dialed up the cops, but realized that I had no connectivity. It was weird since there was a mobile tower just next to my house. Peeked through the window to see both the beasts were purposely damaging the mobile tower with their brute strength. They were a lot more intelligent than I initially thought. The white one looked towards me as it almost gave me a smirk. I escaped my house, laid low, and am currently in a small makeshift hut, typing this out. The internet connectivity is almost non-existent, so I don't even know if this message will reach out to you or not. I will keep updating you guys. If I am alive, unfortunately my phone is going to die on me in a few minutes. I can hear their howls in the distance. This story takes place my freshman year of college at the University of Alabama. Since I was living in the dorms, my friends and I would often drive off campus and into the country in order to smoke weed away from RAs and the campus PD. On this particular night, one of my friends and I just finished rolling up a giant blunt and drove off into the night to enjoy it. Once we were far enough away, we went ahead and lit it up and continued to drive throughout the duration of it. After it was finished, we drove into a thick fog, had to drive a Cornell Fibum Prow because we literally could not see. We ended up driving out of it and found ourselves in familiar territory. I usually drove away from campus without any real destination, but reflexes, etc. would tend to lead me down the same path. Anyways, we have been here before on previous nights, and there's this creepy stop sign which appears black and unreadable until you are literally five feet from it which we always thought was weird. That has nothing to do with this story, but I tend to ramble, especially when reliving things like this. So after driving out of the fog, we were driving past random houses in the country when we notice a giant black figure and eyes staring at us from the front of someone's yard. We both did a double take like, did you just see that thing? It was so significant that I three point turned my car around to go get a better look. Heading back, I creeped along slowly until we got back to the thing and just stared at it, completely silent. At this point, my car was almost to a stop while I stared in amazement at this giant creature. The thing took notice and stood up slowly onto four feet and then onto its hind legs and I mean this thing was huge. If I were to guess, I would say at least seven to eight feet tall. After a couple seconds, it tears off towards us running like a cheetah basically launching itself through the air with its front legs. When I see this, I slam on the gas and start to take off, 
but the creature reaches the side of my car before I can accelerate fast enough to lose it. It's now on the passenger side of my car, running along with us and staring at my friend through the open window. He's pushing me against the driver's side door in order to give himself distance away from this monster. Judging by the size of my car and that this thing head was literally staring at us through the window, I would say that it stood four or five feet tall on four legs and had a giant head with huge fangs easily capable of ripping off an arm or one of us out of the car. Eventually, with my foot all the way on the gas while staring at this beast in horror and amazement, we gain enough speed to start pulling away from it, 30, 40 mitam piyats, I would guess, and the beast tears off into the woods. We both just sit in silence until we gather ourselves and recount what we saw in order to make sure we both saw the same amazing thing. Some of you may criticize this story since we were both high, but this was an everyday occurrence and we both saw the same terrifying thing. After analyzing other more likely creatures, I came across this picture of a hairless bear, which honestly does look a lot like what we saw. So who knows? So, my grandpa was a normal teenager from the farm. He never did a lot in his teens and was a very average dude. He had a lot of friends tough, from mixed ages. The story begins with him coming back from wandering around with his five close friends at the time. They agreed beforehand to go to one of the friend's house and test a new farm tool that the description was very vague. It was something that people used to cut meat at the time. My mom says that she thinks was a Bosch, machete in German, but could have been just a normal knife ax. They were going there until they saw some angry farmers yelling at each other in the middle of the road. My grandpa and his friends approach asking what happened, and one of the farmers says, This idiot killed my chickens. The other one turns to the guy and says, Fuck you, I did not, my chickens were killed too. To be very specific, those were metropolitan farmers. They did recently move out from the rural area and brought some chickens and seeds to make their personal farms. It was relatively common at the time and some still do those personal farms to this day. But since they were relatively new to the metropolitan area, the chickens weren't at the backyard and yes, at a poor fenced front yard. So, one of my grandpa's friends was a 25-ish year old adult. This guy had already traveled through the country and was familiarized to this type of situation. He says to them to calm down and then points at one of the few dead chickens that were lying around the front yard of one of the farmers. None of you killed the chickens, he says. They were killed by a dog. The farmers look at the chickens and each of them sees the few carcasses that had left of those chickens have had been bitten off large chunks of meat, and the bites did resemble the ones of a dog. The two realize that they were being idiots and apologize to each other. My grandpa and the rest of his friends were just watching the whole thing. I have experience with this kind of stuff. If you want, I can hunt down the damn dog that did this to your chickens, says the 25-ish year old. The farmers look at each other and then look at him. How much? How about 100? I will have to lay some traps and buy some meat so I can lure the hound. The farmers accept. The guy after talking a little with the farmers comes back to the group that was basically doing nothing. Hey, you guys want to help me? We can use those 100 to buy some beer. Needless to say that the four teens were very excited with the idea. 100 bucks at the time was a relatively big amount of money, so a lot of beer was coming. Anyway, they bought some meat, brought the material to make traps and that knife machete axe that I mentioned before. What better test than to kill a hound? So they assemble the traps and discuss plans to make it seem like it was a difficult job so that the farmers don't back down the deal. They go to their homes and assemble at those guys' houses at about 23.30. They place the meat at the traps they get into position and wait for about an hour and a half. Everyone was basically sleeping at this point, and then they see movement at some bushes nearby. Thinking that a normal dog was about to show up, the guys begin to get excited. They can kill the damn hound and go home finally, but guess what? Surprise. It's a 2.5 meters wolf-like beast that comes out of the bushes and roam around the traps, sniffing the air and grabbing the meat, casually destroying the traps that were too small for his size. Everyone was pretty much paralyzed and shitting their pants. The 25-ish guy was with a oh-fuck expression. No one knew what to do. 
the wolf beast appears to notice one of the teens hiding. The thing gets closer and closer to where the guy was. It gets in all fours and makes a position typical of predators. Laying low and preparing to jump at the kid, in a panic one of the teens jumps of its cover screaming and running over to the wolf thing. He is followed by the other two teens and the 25-ish guy. The beast was startled and gets up. My grandpa and his friends attack the wolf thing with their bare fists, virtually making no harm to the creature while the same throws them away with its forearm and pure strength. With one blow, the thing turns around to my grandpa that was at this point thrown to the ground like he was a piece of paper. Basically, he weighed nothing to that creature that had just essentially made him and three friends of his fly to different directions. Out of the sudden, the wolf thing starts to scream and howl. It turns around to reveal a knife machete axe halfway deep into his back, desperately trying to reach it and take it off. In front of the creature was my grandpa's friend that was in cover a minute ago, fearing for his life. Needless to say that the wolf thing was more than pissed. It turns to my grandpa's friend, growling. Still with the knife machete axe in its back, my grandpa then runs over to the beast just to take that object off its back, then sink into his back again making another deep wound and taking it out of its back again. The beast howls and throw my grandpa away another time. The thing gets in all fours and runs off. My grandpa and that 25-ish guy run to get that thing. Now they were pissed. My grandpa was armed with that knife machete axe and the 25-ish guy was with a trunk or a pointy stick. So, those big wounds in its back made a trail of blood that my grandpa and his 25-ish friend followed all night. When they get to the wolf thing house, they find a guy naked with two large wounds in its back. The guy just stands there looking into nothing in the middle of the room. The 25-ish guy takes a rope that was close to the door and laces the guy cowboy style. Then they drag the guy outside and tie him to a tree trunk. When outside, they realize that the entire night was spent hunting that guy. They pretty much knew about werewolves, but didn't know what to do now. They didn't have anything that would allegedly kill a werewolf. So my grandpa just goes and asks to one random guy to go get the police. The police arrives. My grandpa and his 25-ish friend told them what happened. The police shrugs and arrest my grandpa, his friend, and the allegedly werewolf for fighting. They didn't believe in one word that my grandpa and his friend said. They do some interrogation. My grandpa stays in jail until evening. Then he and his friend get released. Apparently, the allegedly werewolf was wanted for the assassination of a guy in Sao Paulo. Anyway, they go back to the rest of the gang and tell what happened. They pretty much promise never to talk about it since nobody would believe them, and the treatment for craziness at the time was way harsh. That knife machete axe became legendary in that circle of friends, but it was lost due to time. No one ever found it or talked too much about it. In accordance to what my mom said, the knife machete axe fell in a lake or was thrown into a lake. Again, no one really knows for sure. My grandpa had two ribs broken and his elbow was cracked. The other guys pretty much were intact, except for the 25-ish guy that fell with his arm into a pointy rock and needed to get patched. The farmers didn't want to pay my grandpa and his friends, but the police gave them a reward of 350 bucks. Naturally, they spend it all in one night. Oh my God, Sophie said, and fell back against the sheets, exhausted. I haven't been fucked like that since I was a little girl. I fell down next to her, panting as well, and laughed. Sophie, that's terrible. I grabbed the pillow from beneath my head and hit her with it, and her breasts jiggled. What can I say you bring out the worst in me? She smiled beneath her messy hair, moist with sweat. Huh, don't I know it? I smiled back. You'll pay for that. Later. Sophie threw the pillow back, and it hit me in the face. We fell asleep, and when we woke up, the evening had turned night. Damn, I said. Now my sleep cycle's going to be all messed up. Sophie got out of bed and got dressed. She slipped on her watch and looked at its face. Double damn, I'm going to be late for Lydia's party. She pulled her sweater over her head. I've got to run, dear, but it's been smashing as always. She bent down to kiss me, and I kissed her on the lips. Of course, always too busy for little old me, I said wistfully. Sigh. What is a boy to do? 
I put the back of my hand up against my forehead dramatically and laughed. She stuck out her tongue at me. Bye, Tommy. Bye, Sophie. I got dressed and headed out to the bar. I was meeting Jack at 10. It had started to rain, and then night felt cold and alive, earlier than it was. It was when I passed by the alley on 73rd, next to that Chinese restaurant, the narrow one that somehow seemed extra dark and always freaked me out, ever since I had started noticing it, that I heard a strange noise. It sounded like a mix between a yelp and a growl. I stopped in my tracks, not knowing whether to investigate or run. My choice was made for me, though. A woman stumbled out of the alley. The sight of her made my blood run cold. She was wearing a shredded tank top and jeans, both soaked in blood. She had blood in her hair and on her face, too. There was so much of it that it was pooling down by her feet. I wanted to call out to her, but my voice was stuck in my throat. She didn't need me to say anything, though. She was already making her way over to me. Are you hurt? I managed to whisper, but the look on her face answered that for me. It wasn't a look of pain or fear, it was a look of determination, of anger, of hatred. It was then that I began wondering if the blood was hers or someone else's. I panicked, fearing for my life. I should have run, I know that now. But hindsight is 2020. I guess the adrenaline made me think that I was stronger than her. Plus, I thought to myself, what if she is hurt and needs help? Did I really want to walk away from someone who could be dying? She was only a few feet away from me when she fell to the ground. I should have asked her if she was okay. I should have said that I was going to get help. I should have ran, but I didn't. I did the opposite. I walked up to where she was sitting and I crouched down next to her. That was where everything went wrong. Suddenly the woman jumped up and before I could move, she threw me to the ground. My vision turned starry as a searing white pain burst through my skull. I only partially saw her face as she bent towards me. I couldn't tell if it was just the blurriness, but were her teeth sharpened? Now is not the time to worry about people's dental hygiene, I reminded myself, trying to pull myself away from whoever this crazy bitch was. My head immediately disagreed, screaming in agony. The woman barked out a laugh above me. There was nothing else I could do but slowly, pathetically, painfully try to drag myself across the sidewalk and as far away as possible. With every shift of my body, she took a patronizing step towards me. Ah shit, I finally hit the wall. She started bending down towards me again. I tried to scream, but all that came out was a low moan. I was powerless against whatever she was going to do. Without warning, her head jerked hard to my neck and ripped at the skin, leaving a huge gaping wound as her nails dragged down my chest. I don't remember if I physically screamed, but mentally I have never been louder. A few more bites, and I was on the verge of passing out. From the distance, somebody screamed, and all I could think in my fucked up state was, same. For some reason, the woman attacking me seemed off put by this, and got up, slinking back into the alley, tripping onto her hands and knees as she did. As red and blue flashes soon came into my quickly fading vision, I realized that somebody must have called the police or an ambulance. I vaguely noticed two people run over to with some sort of contraption, and they began to lift me up onto it. There, I whispered, trying to point to the alleyway, but my arm falling miserably to my side. What? One of the people said. The woman, I slurred out. They didn't seem to understand. It's all right, sir. We're going to take you to help. I kept trying to tell them who attacked me, but to no avail, as I passed out almost as soon as they rolled me into the ambulance. I woke up in a hospital bed with no recollection of anything that had happened the night before. Very slowly, the pieces started to fill in. I tried to sit up, but there was so much pain everywhere that I immediately collapsed again. Rendered immobile, all I could do was wait for someone to come check in on me. What felt like forever later, I noticed two people standing outside my door. I didn't recognize them, but I could recognize that they seemed to be arguing over something. Eventually, the man ran his hands over his face before quietly stepping into my room. Tommy, he said, good to see you awake. I am Dr. Engleman. What? I couldn't manage any more words than that. I truly was exhausted. 
Ah yes, there are quite a few things to tell you. Would you like the good news first, or the bad news? Good news, I croaked out through a parched mouth and cracked lips. I saw his eyebrows raise a fraction as he ticked off a box that read, Cognizant and Responsive. He looked back up at me and saw my eyes on his clipboard, which he turned so that I couldn't read it. Well, Tommy, the good news is that we saved your life. You will recover all your motor functions and mostly lead a normal life. He stopped talking and looked at me. Bad news? I croaked, drinking some water. Well, not sure exactly how bad it is, or if it is entirely bad. There is quite a bit of cosmetic scaring from the animal attack, and once we get you fit enough to leave of your own recognizance, or a family member comes to get you, we can discuss some options in that respect. Now the odd news, the animal that attacked you seems to have infected with what seems to be some sort of benign form of rabies. I sat up suddenly. In shock, the doctor placed a gentle hand on my shoulder. Tommy, please, relax. I said it was benign, which means we believe it is harmless. I was still skeptical, and Engelman could see it plain as day on my face. We treated you while you were unconscious for rabies. That's part of the muscle soreness you're feeling, and it seems to have paid off. You're a lot better off than you were when they brought you in here two weeks ago. I dropped my water cup and found my voice again. Two weeks? It made my throat raw. What the... Please tell me you're fucking with me. Engelman gave me a sheepish look and explained, You presented with swelling of the brain, and the bite was severely infected, and we thought it prudent to place you in a medically induced coma. I sat there and took in the news. I asked absentmindedly for a phone to call Sophie, or my folks. I called Sophie first. Tommy, she exclaimed, I'm already on my way with your parents. They called them, then they called me as soon as you were awake. We chit-chatted about how I was feeling and what all I couldn't remember. In less than 20 minutes, they all three burst into my room. It hurt to talk. Not much had changed since I was attacked. I was a missing person for a few days before everyone was sorted out. Then I asked Soph to close the door. Listen, it wasn't an animal, it was a woman that bit me. They looked at me sideways. Tommy, my mother cooed. I think they would be able to recognize if it was a person. Soph sat her hand on my head. I shook it under her fingernails for a refreshing scratch. That simple action soothed me. Ever since waking up, it had felt like my head was being split slowly in half. It felt like every muscle I had was stiff and sore. I had constantly felt on edge, and the attack from two weeks ago flashed through my mind. I could still see the woman's hunched back, the mania in her eyes, her jagged teeth. Wait, was it really a woman? My mother had a point. Maybe the doctors were right. Maybe it really was a rabid animal that had attacked me. My head pained me, my vision swam, I didn't know anymore. All I knew was that I felt happy with Sophie there, scratching my head. Everything's going to be all right, babe, she said. I closed my eyes. Thanks. Thanks for coming here so quickly. It's fine, Sophie said. You should really be thanking Dr. Engelman and the other doctors here. They saved you. We were scared to death, Tommy. We thought we'd lost you. I spent about a week here, waiting by your side. I'm sorry. Fuck, I'm so sorry. There's nothing to be sorry about, son, my father said. None of this is your fault. We're just glad you survived. The others weren't so lucky. The others? I croaked. My mother slapped my father's arm and said something to him in a hushed whisper, but he continued. There were a few other victims, others round the area who got attacked by the same animal. Ten people died that night, maybe more. Sir? I recalled the scream I had heard on the night of the incident so it had been another victim. That's terrible, holy shit, I said. Sophie told me more. Word is that the doctor and his team proposed the same coma treatment for the others. Unfortunately, it wasn't as effective for them. Apparently, you were all in critical conditions, and the treatment was a Hail Mary that may or may not have worked. That, that's not what Dr. Engelman said, I stammered. She patted me on the head, ruffling my hair, comforting me. He was probably trying to lighten the load for you. You've been through a lot, babe. Don't worry about any of that, sweetie. 
my mother said soothingly. You're safe now and that's all that matters. We don't have to worry about anything else. We were interrupted by someone knocking on the door. My father went to get it. It's Dr. Engelman, he said. They want to do a quick checkup to make sure you're all right. Han, Soph, we have to wait outside. As a team of doctors began to file inside bearing all sorts of notes and equipment, my mother and girlfriend got up to leave. Sophie gave me a quick hug, embracing me in my bed. She pecked me on my right cheek, and then she said something into my ear in a subtle, hushed whisper. Three words. Three words that sent a chill crawling down my spine. Don't trust him. My parents and Sophie left and Engelman came back into the room, a big grin across his face. You're feeling better, son. Quiet and ordeal you've been through. These are the sorts of things he said. He said they were conditionally releasing me, but wanted me to come back in a couple days for observation. I signed some forms. They gave me my things back. Engelman was there still grinning next to me to me the whole time, then finally said goodbye and disappeared into the labyrinthine green hallways of the hospital with his brown clipboard. Mom, Dad, and Sophie were waiting for me at the exit. We all hugged, and Sophie kissed me. I love you, son, my dad said. I'm just glad you're all right. I love you too, Dad, I said. I just want to go home. Mom and Dad said goodbye and got into their white Chevy and drove away. Sophie and I got into her car and took off out into the night. It was dark outside and the moon was bright and full and round and white. Two weeks, I thought. It feels like months have passed. It felt like time had no meaning anymore. I scratched behind my ear and looked at the hairs on my arm. They seemed darker. Then I remembered somehow. Sophie said how crazy everything was and how she thought I was dead. She started to cry and I watched her wipe away tears glistening in the moonlight with her index finger. Her left hand stayed on the steering wheel, but I could see she clutched it tightly. It was dark in the apartment. The only light was that of the full moon pouring in through the bay windows. I didn't turn on the lights. For some reason, I didn't feel like it. Just threw my things on the floor and kicked off my boots. Sophie reached for the light switch, but I grabbed her hand. Tommy, she said softly. Her cheeks were still wet from crying. What are you doing? Shh, I said and kissed her. My lips were still dry. She kissed me back hard and then held me, and in the darkness I couldn't quite tell, but it sounded like she was crying again. I missed you so much, she said. I put my hands on her and we kissed again. Her tongue was warm and soft in my mouth, and it tasted good, like really good. Have you ever had a steak that was so perfectly cooked that you had to resist from shoving the whole thing in your mouth? It was like that, only better. I couldn't help myself. I bit her tongue. Ow! Sophie screamed and jumped up. What the fuck, Tommy? I started apologizing profusely, tripping over my words as I took a gentle step towards her. Babe, I don't know what... I mean, I didn't... It... I... I... As I kept walking towards her, I could feel myself wanting to bite into her flesh again. Oh God, it was overwhelming. I spent my entire consciousness trying to push it back down my throat. I don't even remember how I got her to sit back down again, but somehow we were back on the couch together. Close, very close. It was like I could smell her heartbeat. It was right there in her throat and I needed it down mine. Something animalistic came from deep inside me and I started ripping apart her skin, trying to get whatever it was I needed from her. I hear her screams for a moment and then suddenly, they stopped. I wasn't even aware of what I was doing, it just felt right. The taste of her skin and the texture of her blood, and finally, I knew why that woman attacked me like this. Oh shit. I don't know why that thought snapped me out of my craze, but suddenly, I sat back and looked at what I had done. There was Sophie, or what was left of Sophie, covered in dark red from my couch to my kitchen. I had done that, yet I felt almost nothing. I knew deep inside me that I should be panicking, hyperventilating, running, screaming out of my building, but that part was silenced by everything else in me. I calmly stood up and walked into my bathroom. It was only when I looked in the mirror that I began to feel. There was my reflection, except it looked nothing like me at all. Suddenly, I had a huge mange of hair all over my chin, some covering the rest of my face. 
As I internalized what I saw, I raised my hand to feel my face and saw that my hand too was suddenly covered in more hair than a dog's tail. Then sensed that none of this, none of that, should have happened hit me all at once, and I began to freak out. I clawed my skin wishing desperately to be who I was only last month, when Sophie and I were happy and together and alive and normal and and... It took what felt like forever for me to calm down. I'm still panicked. I'm still lost. But I made myself sit up and look back in the mirror. It was too much. Too much change. Too much hair. I know. I know. It's fucked up to be sitting here worrying about a beard when my girlfriend's corpse is torn up in my living room. Nothing makes sense right now. Nothing has made sense since the night of the attack. You know, I was going to turn myself in. I was. I don't want to live like this, knowing what I did, knowing that I liked it. But there's only one thing that stopped me. Just a minute ago, I got a call from Dr. Engelman. With a shaky hand, I slipped my phone out of my back pocket and picked it up. But before I could even say anything, he whispered, Shh, there's no time. I know what you just did. I know what you are. Don't worry, I'm coming. Just close all your blinds, all right. Don't let the moonlight in and don't go outside. I'm coming. And with hat, he hung up. So, what? I turn myself in, saying that I'm a werewolf now and be put in a mental hospital. Or I wait here and hope that Dr. Engelman know what he's talking about. I could run away, but that only increases the risk that I'll hurt another person. To me, it seems that I only have an option. I can only hope it's the right one. Still, as I sit here waiting, Sophie's words keep playing in my mind, like she was still whispering them into my ear at this very second. Don't trust him. We were always told not to venture out on Werewolf Road late at night when we were children. But one night, we were just too damn determined to know why the teenagers from our small town were so frightened by the unnerving place that we had to see for ourselves. I had my small backpack loaded with snacks, a flashlight with spare batteries, a flare gun with a can of bear spray, and attached to my backpack was my sleeping bag. The four of us gathered together behind my cousin's house, who lived just two houses down across the street, and together we all exchanged scary legends and stories we had heard about the road and the cemetery on it. I heard there's a woman in the trees who jumps on people's cars late at night. She sleeps on a mattress with her dead, rotting baby, Evan said with a morbid sense of pride in his voice. That's baloney, my cousin Justin said, shaking his head. I heard she was just drunk and that happened once. The baby wasn't dead. The police took it from her though, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. You guys ever hear about the dead puppy in the box my brother found in the cemetery? I said aloud. The other three looked at me, their eyes widening with interest as I spoke up. He said he went up there alone one day around, two years ago when we moved here. He said he was walking through the graveyard and near one of the tombstones there was a purple box. He saw blood on the outside of the box and grabbed a stick to open it, and there was a dead puppy that someone sacrificed. He looked up and saw streamers in the trees and an area where it looked like there was a fire. For four adolescent boys with active imaginations, you could only picture how terrified we were. There would have been next to no possibility that we would venture out anywhere such as that alone, but together it was a different story. We were all in this together, despite how frightening it was. Oh, come on, he's just jacking with you. Ronnie, the youngest of us four, spouted. I could tell if he was lying, and believe me, he wasn't. He had a look on his face that makes me feel like he wasn't. Are we going to do this or not? Justin said, seemingly irritated by the stories. We each shrugged and picked up our belongings, and next thing we knew, we were walking towards the woods that led to the legendary road on the other side. The leaves and sticks cracked beneath our feet as we stumbled around in the pitch-black summer night. Justin had his flashlight shining ahead of our group. The narrow beam shone the heavy thicket that surrounded us. In some places, you could see, even in the absence of light, the silhouettes of fast food litter like styrofoam cups of various sizes and plastic bottles or discarded cans that were scattered about. I felt the crunch of an empty beer can under my foot. I cursed under my breath as I realized just how loud and inconvenient my misstep was. Evan turned around and shushed me as we continued walking. Fuck off, Evan, I said in a stern but quiet voice. 
I raised my hand as he turned forward, the thought crossing my mind to smack the back of his head. I bit my bottom lip and considered how bad that could be for us if the wrong group of people noticed our presence. Okay, I can see the road. We need to decide right now if we are going to drop our stuff off first and then continue, or if we're going to take everything, Justin said. I looked around at the flat, dry ground that was covered in leaves nearby. That looks like a perfect area to set up camp, I said, pointing at the spot. We all four removed our bags as we walked over to the grounds I chose, setting them down. Anything valuable any of you might need to grab before we go? Justin asked. I ran to my bag and grabbed the bear spray, assuming it would be good just in case we ran into some trouble. Ronnie and Evan shook their heads and continued with him as he moved his flashlight from off our newly claimed campsite and headed for the cemetery on Werewolf Road. I quickly caught up to them as we continued. In the humid summer night there wasn't a sound to be heard besides a barn owl that could be heard in a tree nearby and our feet lightly moving across the earth. We reached the dirt road and I raised my head and looked around as what sounded like something heavy fell through a mess of branches, perhaps a decrepit tree or a large animal. Whatever that was, it wasn't small, I heard Ronnie say. I looked over at him and was leaning over his bent knees, wiping his sweaty face off with his dark shirt. He raised up and shook it, attempting to cool off. We four sat in silence. The night now grew more ominous. We stared at the dirt road, and I now looked to the right, remembering the wooden bridge that led to the cemetery. It's this way, I said. We continued walking. I turned around to notice the rest of the group behind me, Justin still holding the flashlight, but aiming it up in the trees rather than the very dark road ahead. Justin, can I see the flashlight? I asked. Here you go, he said as he quickly stretched his arm out and held it out like the Olympic torch. We approached the wooden bridge. As we came closer, I looked out at the creek where you could see a pile of dead hogs, perhaps six or more, on the creek bed. The stench from their rotting, bloated corpses fouled the air. On the bridge was a pentagram drawn out near the very center. It had been faded from the elements, but you could still see it fairly well. We gathered around it, not saying a thing aloud. The cemetery is just up the road, I said. We continued across the bridge, and I noticed that Ronnie turned his head and looked back at the creek where the dead hogs were. Did you guys see that or smell it at least? We continued walking, not thinking too much about it. There could have been many reasons for that. Not every little thing had to be unusual, even to young boys who longed for excitement. As we got closer to the cemetery, we noticed a bright light coming from inside its fence. It was a fire. We rushed down the road, trying our best to stay low and keep quiet as we grew dangerously closer to the cemetery. We got off the road and made our way up a ditch which led us into the woods that surrounded the cemetery fence line. As we lined up to peer through the fence, we were careful to stay low. Embers lingered around the blaze like fireflies in the cemetery landscape, and we watched as these beings that gathered around the fire. They weren't human. There hadn't been a chance they were human at all. They were beastly, savage creatures that were swift on all fours. When they were on the lookout, they stood on their hind legs and perched, exposing their ape-like chests and torsos. The rest of their bodies looked more canine, like a greyhound. Their faces were covered in heavy, beaked masks that looked similar to the surgeon makes worn during the Black Plague, but these were more of a ghastly sight on such already terrifying monsters. I knew we couldn't dare trespass on their fiery territory. I watched as one lurked near a tombstone and dug like a canine into the ground. I listened as we could hear what sounded like gurgling coming from the plot, dirt being thrown viciously behind the creature. The rest of the pack began to gurgle and click their mouths as they walked around the fire. Three other creatures gathered near the burial plot where the first creature dug, and the other three stood on their hind legs and looked around. I watched as the creature that was now burrowed deep in the ground climbed out of the hole with a rotting arm in its mouth. It sat next to the others arm between its two hands, sniffing. The others gurgled and sniffed in between chirps. Another creature crawled into the hole and came back to the surface with a dismembered leg in its mouth and carried it away from the rest of the group. Justin looked over at the rest of us with a face full of shock and he spoke very hesitantly 
in an almost faint whisper, trying his best to control his breathing. We've got to get the hell out of here. I don't know what those things are, but they aren't people. I say we leave our stuff at the campsite and get back to my place fast. The four of us backed away from the fence, and we got as close to the bottom of the ditch as we could. We knew that any little noise from us could be fatal. The sticky summer air attracted unrelenting mosquitoes that swarmed around our ears and our sweaty necks and arms. We tried for our lives to ignore the high-pitched buzz that rang in our ears as we crept towards the bridge. I heard a gurgling sound in a nearby tree overhead. It rattled and clicked, signaling the others to move in on us. I looked up to see it as, through its frightening mask that covered its disfigured face, it looked down on me with its black, dilated pupils as I felt the sweat collect in my eyes and the mosquitoes I refused to away at bite into my neck. The other three were frozen in place, staring at the creature as well. I smelled urine in the air from Ronnie, as he couldn't anymore hold his bladder in fear. I couldn't blame him. There wasn't a moment for ridicule or disparagement. The creature stared into our eyes, and I heard the fence line viciously rattle as the other creatures climbed and jumped it, closing in on our misfortunate, desperate souls. Justin spoke up. Guys, any ideas? I slowly reached into my pocket and felt for a lighter. In my other pocket was the big can of bear spray. We let them close in on us dangerously to our discomfort, but I knew this was an ample opportunity to quickly discharge as much of the can on them as I could while we still had a chance. I watched as the creatures fell on their backs, croaking and clicking their tongues with this very awful and loud scream that came out in between gurgles and rattles. They nervously clicked more after this. The creature in the tree appeared to fear jumping. It leapt in the opposite direction, scurrying near the cemetery fire. We quickly rushed across the bridge, we jumping into the creek near the dead hogs and trudging through the water. It was only five minutes or less to Justin's home. The time we counted down together, not allowing failure to escape the grip of such vile and heinous of creatures. We saw the porch light nearby as we entered into the neighborhood. It had been a welcome relief to know that we had arrived finally. As I reached Justin's patio under the floodlight, I took a moment to catch my breath. I turned my head to look around and I realized I had been the only one who reached my cousin's backyard. I called out each of their names, but without success. I waited around five minutes when I saw the beam of Justin's flashlight shine into the backyard from over the fence. I watched as him and Evan and Ronnie boosted each other over his fence as I continued to walk over to them and ask them what exactly kept them so long. I watched them and something seemed different about their demeanors. They each had a look in their eyes that unnerved me. Justin spoke up. You left us behind. You didn't even let us catch up with you. What the hell were you thinking? He said angrily. I walked in circles looking up at the three of them as they stared at me with unequivocal disapproval nonetheless. After the three of them refused to talk to me that night, I finally decided to walk home. As I got to my room, I quickly stripped to my boxers and fell onto my bed. I woke up around 8.30 in the morning to my father calling out to me from his office and he said, Tyler, come in here right now. I walked into my father's office. I watched as he held his bald fist over his mouth, leaning back in his leather chair. He ran his other hand through his hair and looked at me. Your cousin and your friends are missing. What happened last night? I thought about it for a moment, but hesitated on giving a full disclosure. We just hung out till early this morning and then I came home around one o'clock this morning. They were there when I left. Did you go anywhere with them or did they have somewhere they wanted to go? He leaned forward. The only place we went to was the cemetery on Werewolf Road.